Hello, I'm Kendall House, and this presentation is called Is Evolution Only a Theory? And in it, we're going to address that question. Well, is evolution only a theory? I hope you enjoy it. Hello, and this presentation is called Is Evolution Only a Theory? Part 1. So evolution is indeed a theory, and we've been talking about the various concepts that are involved in evolutionary theory. And we said already that it's really a bundle of theories. Theories like natural selection, common ancestry, descent with modification, and many others. But uh, when we're talking about evolution as a theory, we need to stress that it's a, a robust scientific theory. And so the question is, what do we mean by robust on the one hand and scientific on the other? And that's the question we're going to try to answer here. So theories are often confused with hypotheses. And we use this that way in ordinary English all the time. So we might say, uh, in theory, the rocket should fly. And of course, we talk about things and say it ain't rocket science because so many early efforts to launch rockets failed. Uh, this is a 1956 attempt by the United States where the rocket, uh, which was carrying a satellite, uh, simply blew up and burned up on launch. So rocket science uh, was quite challenging. But although we use theory that way, we should say in that case, hypothetically, the rocket should fly. Because scientific theories are not themselves hypotheses, but rather they're concepts that give rise to hypotheses and they're concepts that also help us to interpret the evidence that those hypotheses lead us to. So there's a difference between a theory and a hypothesis. And generally speaking, a theory itself usually isn't directly testable, but rather we try to turn it into hypotheses that we can test. Now, theories are also often confused with facts. And you've probably heard the statement, evolution is only a theory, uh, not a fact. And that's rather confusing from a scientific perspective, because theories being concepts can't really turn into facts, um, depending on what we mean by these terms. So if we look at the word fact, it's usually used in one of two ways. We might talk about the facts. And by the facts, we mean the evidence. So if we're interested just in the facts, then usually we're interested in the evidence and we say we don't want to know anything about any hypotheses or theory, but just the evidence. And that could be rather hard to accomplish. And the other way fact is used, we'll put it with a capital F, is to mean something that's certain, uh, absolute truth. Now, if we look at this first uh, meaning, the facts is the evidence, the question we really want to ask in a scientific framework is, what is it that makes evidence scientific? And if we look at that second definition, then it doesn't really fit science at all, because science isn't about absolute truth. But we can pose the question, uh, what creates our confidence that our scientific theory is true in a less uh, absolute sense? And we could even take that truth off and just say what things or what characteristics uh, lend confidence to scientific theories. So let's start with two initial observations. And the first one is that scientific theories never stop being theories. And that's the case even if they're well supported. The theory of gravity is still a theory even though it's very well supported and it's very predictive. And secondly, scientific facts are never absolute truths, and that's because absolute truth is incompatible with science 
because science is ultimately all about questioning. It's about being able to question both the evidence and to challenge theories. So nothing in science is beyond question. So let's uh, rethink theories in a scientific vein. And the first step here, uh, we're going to define scientific theories as simply concepts or ideas. And many of you are probably aware of the uh, metaphor where we associate an idea with a light going off. And if we ask where theories come from, uh, scientists just invent them. They just make them up. Um, that's where scientific theories come from, out of the imagination, just like songs. And uh, why do they do that? Uh, why invent theoretical ideas? And there's at least three functions that scientific theories have. And one function of scientific theories is that they tell us what we're studying. And this is terribly important. So an example of this is adaptation. Uh, that's a concept in a theory, but it, we can't really study adaptation unless we have a definition of what we mean by that. And so one thing that theories do is they define our terms. In doing that, they literally shape uh, our field of study. So when we're talking about adaptation in a Darwinian sense, we're generally talking about features of organisms that are the result of natural selection. And this means that an adaptive feature is one that confers reproductive advantage. But if we don't have that definition, then we don't have that notion of adaptation and we won't interpret the observations the same way. The second thing theories do is they generate our research questions. Really, uh, most questions don't come from observations, but from the interaction of observations and theories. And many uh, research programs come right out of theories before any observations have been made. So one thing that we can say is that theories come before the facts. And this is often called deductive thinking. There's another meaning of deductive thinking in logic, uh, but in general use, we often say, well, if you work uh, deductively, you start with a theory and generate a hypothesis, and then you go out and collect evidence to, to test that hypothesis. So in this uh, view, we have theories, and theories give rise to questions, and questions lead to evidence, and evidence is the actual observations that we make. An example would be the theory of kin selection that you're going to learn about. And kin selection then generates questions, and that leads to evidence about relatedness. Without kin selection theory, we're probably not that interested in genetic relatedness as something that shapes our behavior. A third function of theories is that they make the facts matter. So when we're thinking about the facts as the evidence, um, theories shape how we interpret that evidence. And this, again, there's a different meaning in logic, but when we generally use inductive thinking, we mean starting with the evidence and working up towards concepts. So inductive theory, uh, thinking goes from the evidence to the theory, but then the theory shapes the interpretation of the evidence. And in this sense, uh, theories also come after the facts. So a good way to think of scientific theories is that they come before the facts and they come after the facts. They're all the way around the facts. They envelop the facts. So if we have evidence about genetic relatedness, it can be hard to know what that means um, unless we have the theory of kin selection. And that's what that box should say right there. So to illustrate this, we're going to look at uh, a story I like to go back to. It's a story of a radio telescope at Bell Labs in New Jersey in 1964. And that's a photo of the actual radio telescope. And they got this uh, telescope all assembled and put together and, and the astronomers using it became convinced that it was malfunctioning. And the reason why they thought it was malfunctioning is because wherever they pointed it, uh, whichever part of the universe they scanned, 
they came up with a low level background radiation. They got this low level signal. So they went back over it uh, many times trying to figure out what they did wrong and decided, well, it seemed to be put together right. Um, they even considered that maybe the bird droppings from pigeons that had accumulated were the problem. So they kept cleaning it, um, but they kept observing the same thing. Uh, they considered that maybe the Pentagon was doing something in the area. So Vir New Jersey's not too far from uh, Virginia, and there's a lot of military installations. So they contacted them and couldn't come up with anything that would be producing what they were observing. And so they were simply puzzled. They had evidence they were observing something, but they couldn't uh, figure out for the life of them uh, what it meant. Now, it turns out that not too far away at, at Princeton, there was a theoretical physicist who wasn't doing observations, but in his mathematical work, he had come to the conclusion that if the Big Bang had occurred, there should be a low level of background radiation everywhere in the universe. And he was scratching his head, wondering how he could observe that. So you can kind of see where this is going. You have the astronomers who are observing low level background radiation. They don't know what it means. You have the physicist and he knows what it means, but he doesn't have the observations. And the way the story goes is that they bumped into each other at a scientific meeting and immediately uh, they recognize the significance of the observation. So this is called CBR, cosmic background radiation. And CBR is, was the first evidence in support of the Big Bang Theory. And of course, it wasn't evidence in support of that uh, without the Big Bang Theory. So from this, we can gather that without the theoretical idea, you might have the evidence, but it's meaningless to you. On the other hand, it's not enough just to have the theory. Uh, you also need to make observations. So the thing about theory, then, is that it answers the so what question. What do our observations mean? I had a student one semester who was very disturbed by this lecture, and he said, yes, uh, but there are 18 people in this room. That's just a fact. You can't say that's not a fact. And uh, I said, yeah, but so what? Um, how do we define a room? How do we define a person? And uh, why does it matter that there's 18 people in this room? Uh, this is a photo of a, what looks like a college classroom, but if we move to a boarding school uh, in the United States in the 19th century, maybe there's an entirely different significance uh, to when we're talking about people in a room. And theories, what they do is they answer those so what questions. They, they give significance to what we're observing. They make the evidence speak to us. And something really important is, although we like to say that we're going to let the facts speak for themselves, the facts never speak for themselves. Uh, without theory, the facts have nothing to say to us. Thank you for listening, and there's one more to go.